the previous teaching, the stones will cry out. I spoke towards the end a bit on how we will need each other in the time to come during the tribulation as friends. That he has given us friends to help us get through life and that this will also be the case in the time to come. He manifests not only his glory through individuals, but has determined that his glory will be made manifest through a united body in love, that is to say the church. And today we are going to talk about friendship again. And you may have seen how he has indeed been speaking to me about friendship, especially the short encouraging word I posted on YouTube. What a friend we have in Jesus. If you have not watched that video yet, I encourage you to do so. So previously we spoke about our friends, but today we will speak about his friends. In 2 Timothy 3 from verse 16 we read, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. It's interesting to note that the letters in Revelation given to John to give to the different churches, that one particular sentence is mentioned in all of them. Let him who have ears to hear, hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Now, why is this said in, in each letter? And why is the wording not let him who have ears to hear, hear what the Spirit is saying to this church? It is said in plural. And each letter ends with the same wording. This is so that we will understand that all the churches must hear what is said to all the seven churches. Each letter is applicable to us, much like we would read all the letters written to the different churches in the New Testament and know that they are all applicable to us. We do not get to decide that this letter of Paul is applicable to us and not the other. Or Luke is only for us, but not Matthew. All of scripture is written for us and we are to understand their types and shadows but not dismiss them. Don't be a picky eater. So it would be foolish of us to think that only the church of Ephesus is applicable to us or the church of Smyrna or the church of Philadelphia. You are, if you are part of the work abroad, you will stay here to experience the things they experience. The scripture tells us that that which was shall be again, therefore. As we are now in the age of the church of Laodicea, when the tribulation starts, we will again start at the church of Ephesus, then Smyrna, and so on, until we reach the church of Laodicea again at his return to this earth. And the one church will flow into the next church. The church of Ephesus is not going to disappear when it's time for the church of Smyrna. No, they will flow into each other and gradually enter into the reality of what is said in the letter of that church in that time. As circumstances changes and the different seals are opened, bringing with its particular calamity, persecution and hardship, the next church's message will be applicable to us then as things progress. It all depends on how long you will last during this time. In other words, we need to pay attention to every letter because it's written for those who will be here at that time when that letter is applicable or seal is opened or trumpet blown. The fact that all the letters are for our understanding and needs our attention is written in the very first verse of the book of Revelations. The first verse says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant, John. Now these letters are for his servants, so that they may know what will come. And the word servants means bond slaves. Now what is a bond slave? Well, it just so happens to be another name for a maiden as well. A bond slave is a slave that was set free after seven years and because of his devotion to his master or the mere fact that he had nowhere else to go, 
would return to his master and say, I want to serve you because it's better for me to stay with you. In other words, he is willing, a willing slave. Nobody forced him. He himself said, I am willing to stay. The servants are his worker bride, who even though they could have gone to heaven in the escape, the pre-tribulation rapture, decided they will stay behind and endure the hardship and serve their master in bringing in a harvest of the great multitude. These are the servants and they are his priests who at the beginning of the tribulation are given a message by our Lord that when he returns from the wedding that he will come to them. And now we need to ask ourselves why they are not at the wedding. They are his servants. And they are the John the Baptist company who is as a light in the beginning to point to the greater light. Just like we read in John 1. They are the friends of the bridegroom. Just as John was known as the friend of the bridegroom preparing the way. Please do not think that they are not part of the bride. They are, but they have work to do. And this is why he calls them his friends. Note the reference to light which points to the Luke bride being as light in Luke 12. From verse 35, he says, Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. And ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding, that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord when he cometh shall find watching. Verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. And if he shall come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so, blessed are those servants. Now the same scripture is mentioned in Mark's gospel in the 13th chapter. Now remembering that Luke refers to the bride and Mark to the left behind, the scripture in Mark refers to them being caught asleep. There's no mention of their lights burning, no wedding beforehand, and the three different watches is stated differently, even mentioning a cock crowing, once again pointing to Peter's denial. All this points to the left behind church, the sleeping church of which Mark is a type and shadow. All this is not found in Luke because the bride is not asleep. She is watching and praying. Let's read that scripture in Mark 13 from verse 34. For the son of man is a man as a man taking a far journey who left his house, gave authority to his servants and to every man his work and commanded the porter to watch. Watch ye therefore. For you know not when the master of the house cometh, at even, or at midnight, or at the cock crowing, or in the morning. Lest coming suddenly he finds you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. Now, many years ago, I was a firm believer in only the post-tribulation viewpoint. Now, I believe in the pre mid and post view and they are all true and also the reason why the different viewpoints have ample scripture to support itself and this has brought much confusion and division in the body of Christ but few people consider that everybody might just have a very good point so for more of this understanding please visit our website and read the page called end time foundations no need to get angry with me for saying something you might consider blasphemous. Consider that you may just be wrong in your own viewpoint. It's not a salvation issue. But do your part and at least read the whole page and ask Father to confirm this to you. Now, Some of you may have heard this dream of mine. I received this dream approximately 14 years ago. And there are many new subscribers that have not yet heard this. So I ask that you will please bear with me. I share this dream to show you how Father showed me that I will be a worker during the tribulation 
And now he confirmed the scripture of Luke 12 that we just read to me even before I had any understanding of workers or any of these things to come. So the night before this dream was given to me, my husband and I were listening to a sermon regarding a post-tribulation viewpoint. That night, as I was about to go to bed, feeling very distressed, I asked Father for a dream to confirm to me whether I would be here for the tribulation. This was the first time I ever asked for a dream, and he was faithful. I will be honest, at that time I knew absolutely nothing about the worker bride or about the call upon my life to prepare the worker bride. And this is the dream. In this dream, I see myself standing in a doorway on an island looking at a mountain. The next moment, a tsunami comes over this mountain in a matter of seconds and I see myself calmly lifting up my hand and simply say in great authority, still. Immediately, the tsunami faded and came to a stop right at my feet. The next moment, I saw myself again in the same house, but this time the whole house was filled with the water and I saw myself, as if, as if in slow motion, tumbling in the water. Suddenly, the water subsided and not one drop of water was on me. I was completely dry. Then immediately another scene took place. This time, I was looking through his eyes as he came down steps holding a wooden platter with the luscious fruit on it. I then saw myself with others sitting at a table and he began to serve us. So you can see how closely this dream relates to the Luke 12 scripture. Through this dream, he was showing me that he was going to give me great power in the time to come, but that I will have to endure much during this time as well as shown when I was stumbling in the water in the dream. I will not have to worry because no harm will come upon me as shown by not having one drop of water on me. He will return and come and serve me. Now this is at the beginning of the tribulation. And he was not saying to me that all will be well and that I will have amazing power and sail freely through this tribulation. No, he was saying, I will give you power. But remember, with this power will also come persecution. But nobody will be able to lay a hand on you unless I allow this for my divine purpose in what I will use you in. And this is exactly what happened to the apostles when they received power with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Acts 1-2. to And then with great signs and miracles drew many unto salvation. However, this power was not without persecution as read in scripture. And we are to expect it and prepare our hearts now. Another sentence or word used within every church letter in Revelations as well is the word overcome or patience. Now you obviously need patience to overcome. Now the word patience in the Strong's is G5281 and it comes from the word hypomony and it means steadfastness constancy, cheerful or hopeful endurance and to persevere. It comes from G5278, which is the word hypomeno. And this means to persevere under misfortunes and trials, to hold fast to one's faith in Christ, to endure, bear bravely and calmly ill treatments, to have fortitude and endure patiently means to remain, or in our terms, to not cop out or cry, uncle. Strong says of patience the following. It says, in the New Testament, it is the characteristic of a man who is not swerved from his deliberate purpose and his loyalty to faith and piety by even the greatest trials and sufferings. Boy, are we going to need this patience. And when being tortured, will we give our friends away? 
when being so hungry and cold will we take the mark of the beast or steal from our friends? When we see our loved ones dragged away or killed, will we give up? A good testimony to listen to is Richard Wurmbrandt, Tortured for Christ. It's available on YouTube as a movie as well. And Richard Wurmbrandt testifies of how he was 14 years imprisoned and having endured atrocious torment and abuse, never denied Christ or his church. And it's important to read books like these because they encourage us and build us up. DC Talk has two books called Jesus Freaks, All Testimonies of Martyrs and Those Who Went Through Persecution. And another book given out by the Voice of Martyrs is When Faith is Forbidden. And then also Singing Through the Night by Annika Companion. There are many more of these books, but people just do not have the stomach for it when in fact these are faith heroes that have gone before us and passed the baton unto us to finish the race. And when I read this, these books, I'm deeply humbled by their bravery and how he each time came through for them. Yeshua tells his disciples, his servants, the following in John 15, verse 19. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you, The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. And then in John 16 verse 4 he says, But these things have I told you, that when the time shall come you may remember that I told you of them. And these things I said not unto you at the beginning, because I was with you. Now there are no chapters in the original scripture. These chapters are all one conversation. And although this particular chapter points to the 144,000 virgins during the trumpets period of the tribulation, the premise still holds true. He has told them these things so that they would remember that he warned them that they would suffer persecution and that the servant is not greater than his master. So let's get back to his friends. The word friend is a covenant term. Unfortunately, the weight and true essence of the meaning of friend has been lost through the ages and no longer valued in its original meaning. Today you can befriend or unfriend someone with a click of a button. No tolerance or patience with, the one, with one another at all, which seems to be another epidemic of Generation Z. I cannot help but think of what my husband said the other day whilst driving. I said to him that he needs to have patience with the person in front of us. Now it's a joke now between us, um, just our little patience he has. And in a very nonchalant way he said to me, I do not have the patience to be patient. <laughs> I burst out laughing because that should give you an indication of the level of patience he has. And the same can be said of this generation. People just do not know how to extend grace, how to wait, how to endure or how to forgive. Pressing a button is much easier and you do not have to confront anyone. You can just disappear out of their life. Lasting bonds is very few to be found, as we see not only in business partnerships, but also in the divorce rates that being so sky high. Everything faster is considered better. We drink our morning coffee in haste and gulp our food down in a few bites. We no longer sit around a table and talk. Can you imagine Yeshua after he prepared the fish for the disciples on the shore, gulping his food down and saying, Right boys, we've got things to do and places to go. We may look at this and think that this does not affect us, that we are not a part of this. But I believe that this is a spirit permeating the atmosphere of this world, which is as a very dry field ready to be lit up with indignation against those who come against them or oppose their view. And in their intolerance, they will strike. There will be no neutral ground. Either you are with us or you are against us. And that is how it's going to be. 
Is it any wonder that he tells each church to endure or have patience? How is your endurance presently under this light affliction you are now under? And are you seeing what you have to endure now as preparation for what you will have to endure in the coming tribulation? That keeping your mouth shut when criticized, sworn at, degraded or spitefully used is not just a matter of humbling yourself or and sanctification, but is preparing you for what you will have to endure and far worse. Are you able to endure these things without taking it personal, without falling out at the seams and without having to have the last say? Are you quiet as the lamb was before his shearers? Are you giving your back to the smiters? Are you able to wash the feet of the Judas in your house? Are you able to serve him or her with love? Can you pray for them earnestly and with great love? I'm not saying be a pushover or to be someone with no backbone. I'm asking if you are fighting your battle seated next to him in heavenly places. Are you ruling and reigning now? There's a time to speak. And there is a time to keep quiet. It will be at times a matter of death and life. We have to have a clear understanding of what he is about in us. In my own life, I am constantly abused in some shape or form. And this has been going on for almost 19 years. It is emotional abuse that I go through on almost a daily basis. I've learned how to deal with this. How to give my back to the smiters. When they come against me, they come against him. Only how he feels about it and what he wants to do about it matters. I was just thinking about faithfulness in these circumstances. How would it affect my family if I had to fall apart? How would giving up affect our lives in general? And then more importantly, how would it affect those he has given me if I've just decided one day, stuff this, who needs this? I don't need to take this abuse. I've had it. I'm out of here. I certainly have every right and reason by human understanding to do so. But what about the consequences? How would my unfaithfulness towards him in these situations be giving up, by giving up, affect those who listen to me? How would it affect their walk and their faithfulness towards him? So I decided to interpret a dream of one of our fair maidens um, in the middle of writing this teaching. And it is no surprise the interpretation of the dream. It seems to me that Father assigns her dreams after specifically to, uh, often specifically to be included in many of my teachings. And I can say the same of the other fair maidens as well. So here is a dream that she had on the 5th of January this year she says in this dream oh, i'm reading in this dream she and the whole of her family are on a lake she and her mother are floating on a platform with sofas on the rest of her family each have their own platforms and sofas two of her family members are drunk it is the middle of the night on the water are multiple different sets of twin palm trees. They are huge and very tall. These sets of twin palms are also floating around them. There is something in the water and everyone is afraid of it. No one can see it, but they are so afraid of it. She is on the lookout from her floating platform and so is her mother. They are watching the water. And the water is very dark and ominous. Whenever the thing in the water moves, it makes all the palm trees quiver, which then makes everyone else afraid, confused and disorientated. When they stop quivering, the people are back to normal. Okay, now the interpretation of the dream. This dream is about the church as a family, represented by her family members. The lake in itself is a reference to a body of water, which represents people. The church family is floating on platforms, which represent being saved out of the water. The lake or water is dark and ominous, speaking of difficult times or tribulation. 
There is something in the water or the people that generates fear and the family is aware of this. She is with her mother on her platform with the sofa and the sofa speaks of being in his rest and her mother represents the Holy Spirit who is often depicted as a mother figure in dreams. Together they are discerning what is in the water or what is happening amongst the people as water. Then there are two family members that are drunk. And this drunkenness is referred to in Luke 21 where Yeshua tells the disciples to watch and pray that they may be accounted worthy to escape all these things. This is right before the tribulation starts, referring to the escape of the bride. Therefore, this dream is for us now in what we are facing in this year. And he says the following in Luke 21 from verse 34. He says, And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life, and so that that day come upon you unawares. For as a snare shall it come on all of them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch ye therefore, and pray always, that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass, and to stand before the Son of Man. This word drunkenness is a reference to the timing of Noah, where he built the ark and people were given in marriage and strong drink, enjoying themselves. They did not watch and pray. And he says we are to take heed that our hearts are not overcharged with surfeiting, and surfeiting is strong drink as well. So people tend to drink when they go through a difficult time. After all, Proverbs 31, 6 says, Give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish, and wine unto those that be of heavy hearts. Let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his misery no more. Obviously, the wine at that time was not as strong as our wine of today. And this is not a green light to go and drink. The point is that people will be given over to that which will help them to forget their misery. And that takes various forms in this day. We are to take heed to ourselves in this regard. The twin palms on the lake points to Deborah. Now, in Judges 4, we read that Deborah waited under a palm tree as judge of Israel to give wisdom to those who came to her. In my teaching called the Queen of the South, it will be in the description box, I talk about how Deborah is a type and shadow of a pillar. Now, the pillars of faith represent the fivefold ministry, those in leadership, shepherding the flock. Pillars are not only foster fathers and mothers, but they are also representing trees of righteousness. These trees or pillars are the foster fathers and mothers of his children, and they are in leadership position and serve as shepherds of the flock. They are floating on the waters, which means they are also exposed to the difficult times. They are twin palms, referencing Luke 10, where Yeshua sends his disciples out two by two, or the two men on the road of Emmaus to whom he opened their understanding of Scripture. These two examples are types and shadows of those pillars of faith or twin palms that will be sent out. Whatever is in the water generating fear is affecting the twin palms and they are quivering. They are fearful. This then affects the family, the church, who are closely observing the twin palms tree's reaction. Note, when they quiver, which is to walk in fear, the people are afraid, confused, and disorientated. How they react affects those around them. The moment they are calm, the family is calm too. So I'm sure you can see that giving up is just not an option. Father takes me through circumstances in order to bring a message to you. And this weekend, when preparing this teaching, he baptized me in utter weakness to the point that I almost did not want to go on. Why did he need to do this for me to bring this message to you? It was because I needed to prepare this message 
in a place of utter weakness so that he can be my strength and also that I can write from a place of authenticity. It's easy for people who are going through a relatively easy time in life to tell others to stand up. I needed to endure this hardship and the impact it had on me emotionally in conjunction with preparing this teaching. The twin palms were on the lake with the family. They were not to the side giving instructions, but were in the circumstances with them. It was then that I asked my friends to pray for me in this weekend, leaning on them to support me, just like Moses needed to Aaron and her when the battle was going on in the valley. Within myself, I am nothing and I can do nothing. So this morning, when I woke up, I felt the burden lifted because what needed to be said in the teaching was said. So listen to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4 when he upbraids the Corinthians. Let's read from verse 9. He says, For I think that God has set forth us the apostles last, as it were appointed to death. For we are made a spectacle unto the world, and to angels, and to men. For we are fools for Christ's sake, but ye are wise in Christ. We are weak, but ye are strong. Ye are honorable, but we are despised. Even unto this present hour we both hunger and thirst, and are naked and are buffeted, and have no certain dwelling place. And labor, working with our hands, being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we suffer it. Being defamed, we entreat. We are made as the filth of the world and are the offscouring of all things unto this day. Giving up under these circumstances was not an option for Paul because eternity was at stake. And so I looked to my own circumstances in the same light. More is at stake than just my life and happiness. How I deal with my battles matters greatly because it will impact those he has entrusted to me. I knew he was showing me something. It's not that he is saying that we are to be robots and never cry or never be devastated. We have to be real, but do not give up. When you fall, get up. Dust your knees off and do like Dory. Just keep swimming. In Psalm 34 we read from verse 17. The righteous cry and the Lord heareth and delivereth them out of all their troubles. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. But the Lord delivereth him out of them all. He keepeth all his bones, not one of them is broken. Evil shall slay the wicked, and they that hate the righteous shall be desolate. The Lord redeemeth the soul of his servants, and none of them that trust in him shall be desolate. I mentioned earlier that the word friend is a covenantal term. The word friend can also be exchanged for brother or sister or beloved. It speaks of a very close bond. And we find the example of such a friendship with David and Jonathan who exchanged swords, shields, cloaks and more, saying that they enter into covenant with each other. In essence, such a covenant meant what is mine is yours, what is yours is mine. Your goods are mine. And mine are yours. Your enemy is my enemy and your friend is my friend. These two lives that are bound as one. Let's read about that in 1 Samuel 18 from verse 1. And it came to pass when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day and would let him go no more home to his father's house. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was upon him and gave it to David and his garments, even to his sword and to his bow and to his girdle. 
Now, there are different covenants in scriptures, but I want to quickly focus on just one here. We find Laban and Jacob making a covenant with each other to not cross a certain border. And Laban, as his servants, brings stones as witnesses, and Jacob erected a pillar as a witness to his covenant. They then proceeded to have a meal together as these stones would form part of a covenant making. And to share a meal during a covenant was to pass on to each other bread and wine, etc., much as we find Yeshua doing at the Last Supper. He broke bread and gave it to them and passed the cup to them, saying it is his covenant with them. The bread and the wine representing his flesh and blood. And he told them that unless they eat his flesh and drink his blood, they will not be a part of him. Think about what we just shared about David and Jonathan, whose souls were knit together. This is all covenant talk that Yeshua was having with his disciples. At the heart of covenant is becoming one with the other person. In John 13, Yeshua tells Peter that unless he washes his feet, he will have no part in him. This speaks of sanctification. Our feet represents our walk, and it was the custom of that time for servants to wash guests' feet. And here Yeshua tells Peter that he has to wash his feet to have a part in him. And he tells his disciples to do the same, to wash one another's feet. Why? Because he wants us to be one with him, and he wants the body to be one too. It's all about being one with him and one another. What does it mean to eat his flesh and drink his blood? It means to share in his suffering. Even in taking communion, many believers do not know what it means to share in the suffering, which is what communion commemorates. To be part of him, one with him, is to share in his suffering. This is the cost of being a disciple. This is just a follower, as written in John 6. Marriage is sacred because it's a covenant where two people become one. This is the great mystery that Paul refers to when it comes to the bride of Christ. Note, there is a leaving before there is a cleaving. And the same is true with our relationship with him as his disciples. Let's read that in Ephesians 5, verse 30. He says, For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. In fact, the covenant he made with his disciples at the Last Supper was a marriage proposal. He told them to remember him. This was said to the bride during the proposal because the bridegroom went away to prepare a place for him. She is to remember him and watch for his return. He told his disciples that each time they partake in communion, they are to remember him. Why would they forget him? Why did he think it necessary to tell them to remember him? It was that he needed them to remember his suffering and how he overcame, and so they can too if they remember him and wait for his return. This is what he is saying to us. I have a teaching on my previous channel, The Spirit of Wisdom and Revelation, called Remember Me, Church of Smyrna. I will post it in the description box as well. So it will give you greater context on these matters. In John 6 we find that when the followers heard Yeshua saying that they must eat his flesh and drink his blood to have part in him, they turned away and no longer followed him. He then looked to his disciples and asked them if they were going to leave as well. Note, we have followers and we have disciples. Disciples of rabbis, and Yeshua was a rabbi, followed their rabbi wherever he went. It was understood that if you follow a rabbi, you do this to become like your rabbi in every sense of the word. You become one with your rabbi. You look to his life and what he says and does and learn of him to be like him by always being with him. This is a disciple. 
disciples literally follow in their rabbi's footprints. And they knew that once they decide to be a disciple, it meant that they had to follow their rabbi and leave everything behind. This, in fact, lies at the heart of when Yeshua told Peter that he would make him a fisher of men and that he is to follow him. Peter then replied that he needed first to greet his family and bury the dead, to which Yeshua replied that the dead are to bury the dead. In Luke 14, Yeshua says the following about discipleship, making it clear that there is a cost to be counted in being his disciple. There is a difference between a follower and a disciple. Let's read that in Luke 14 from verse 26. He says, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, even his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whatsoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. He's making it very clear that unless you do these two things, it's impossible to be his disciple. He's not playing around with words because he knows our weakness to want to protect those we love, our pull towards being emotionally driven and wanting to play it nice, not wanting to offend. So immediately the first two requirements are made very clear. You must leave all behind and you must bear your cross. Hating your family members, friends and your own life simply means that you are willing to walk away from them and follow him as his disciple, just like Peter and all the other disciples did. You are willing to give up your life, whether in how you live or in death. And this is not just a decision that you make when you give your life to him when you were saved, but actually in giving him your life, he takes your life. You also must bear your cross. Now many Christians out there who do not have a cross, they left their cross at the altar where they got saved. They can quote all the right scriptures, go to church or Bible study and even look after the poor, but they themselves have not allowed him to strip them of these things. So let's read further in Luke 14 of what is required of a disciple. Verse 28, For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and counteth the cost whether he have sufficient to finish it? Lest haply, after you have laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he be able with ten thousand to meet him that cometh against him with twenty thousand? Or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if the salt have lost its savour, wherewith shall it be seasoned? It's neither fit for the land nor yet for the dunghill, but men cast it out. He that have ears to hear, let him hear. There in the last verse we hear the echo of what was said to the churches. Let him who have ears to hear, hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. To give ear to something is to take a note or to pay special attention to what is said. The cost is ultimate to be a disciple of Christ. The cost is ultimate to be one with him and the cost is ultimate to be a close friend of his. Many followers are there, but oh so few disciples. And he compares such disciples that have not counted the cost and dropped out halfway or just before the finish line as salt that is without savour, and men will cast them out. There is a covenant in scripture called the covenant of salt. Uh, quoting from godquestions.org, they say the following about the covenant of salt. In the ancient world, ingesting salt was a way to make an agreement legally binding. If two parties entered into an agreement, they would eat salt together in the presence of witnesses, and that act would bind their contact. 
King Abijah speech in 2 Chronicles 13 5 mentions just such a salt covenant. It says there, Don't you know that the Lord, the God of Israel, have given the kingship of Israel to David and his descendants forever by a covenant of salt? Here Abijah refers to the strong, legally binding promise of God to give Israel to David and his sons forever. Now, the Old Testament law commands the use of salt in all grain offerings and makes clear that the salt of the covenant should not be missing from the grain offerings. Offerings That's in Leviticus 2.13. And since the Levitical priests did not have land of their own, God promised to provide for them via the sacrifice of the people and he called this promise of provision a salt covenant. Here I want to mention that the priest, being sanctified, represents the workers. And the wheat harvest points to the seal spirit of the tribulation, where the vine harvest is during the trumpet spirit of the tribulation. Salt is to be had with the grain offerings. And the workers, the disciples, are the salt of the earth. Let's read Numbers 18 verse 19. All the heaf offerings of the holy things which the children of Israel offer unto the Lord have I given thee, and thy sons and thy daughters with thee, by a statute for ever. It's a covenant of salt for ever before the Lord unto thee, and to thy seed with thee. So a covenant of salt is a covenant of friendship. What does salt losing its savour have to do with discipleship? Yes, we are the salt of the earth and salt is to preserve, but how does this play in with what Yeshua said in Luke 12 regarding counting the cost? It basically means that if we have not counted the cost and have entered into covenant with him as his disciples, breaking that covenant by no longer bearing our cross or not willing to let go of everything, that this will affect our testimony in being his disciples. We will then have no impact on people because we are lukewarm and have given up. The salt then has become useless, not even fit for a dunghill. I want to share a dream with you that I had in this week. At the same time, I want to remind you of the previous teaching, The Stones Will Cry Out, in which I asked, Are you living up to your name. I mentioned briefly how he calls us by name and that he works in you the meaning of your name so that you can live up to your name. Now, I mentioned then also that he's told me that I'm his Anna, his Joseph and his Benjamin. And if you are interested as to how I came to this, you will find my testimonies with regard to this on our website on the last page called About Me. There I go into detail about this. The dream I had this week was with regard to being his Joseph. Now, the blessing that was spoken over Joseph by his father Jacob and Moses was that he would be a fruitful vine at a well. A few years back, I had a vision where I was in the sky overlooking the earth. A vine speedily grew up right through the firmament and I saw the firmament crack as it broke through, growing rapidly up and up. And this made me think of Jack and the Beanstalk. And the next morning, I went into YouTube and saw a video by Nicholson 1968. And the title was, You Think You Know, But You Don't Know Jack. A reference to giants and Jack and the Beanstalk. But I also had a vision of standing in front of myself. And I saw myself growing up in great speed until I reached the ceiling. And I had to bend my back looking down on myself. This too a reference to the vine growing. My father keeps reminding me that I am his Joseph lately. And so Joseph was known and hated for his dreams. He was a son favored. At the same time, when I dreamed about the vine going through the firmament, I bought a black-eyed Susan vine. And there was growth initially, but it died to the point where the brown leaves would crumble in my hands at the slightest touch. There was no hope for this vine but I still gave it some water. And one day I noticed a tiny baby leaf in the corner and it was not long before this vine shot up like my vision to the roof where I tied a fishing line for it to grow along the roof. 
I share this testimony with you so that you may be encouraged by this to know that names are very important to him. Your name is important to him. To name someone is to make them your own. And we belong to him who has named us and calls us by our name. And so through the years, he has dealt with me in such a way to make me a fruitful vine, which most definitely included heavy pruning. And in one of the words he has given me, he told me that the heavens will open up. He will tell me of things to come and that he has prepared me for this for the time to come, even if I do not understand yet what the purpose is. I have another page on our website called Dreams and Visions and there is a video posted called When God Speaks where I speak on the different ways he speaks to us including dreams and visions and I also have a document in which I talk about dream interpretation briefly so you're welcome to go and read and watch that. So I want to share this dream that I had with, with you about the vine. In this dream I went outside to where the vine is. I noticed that Danny cut the vine off in half. I was upset at first not knowing why he did this, but saw that the vine was sturdy and strong. And I concluded that this was a good thing. And that was the end of the dream. Now when interpreting this dream, I was focused on the fact that he had cut the vine completely in half instead of just pruning it. The words cut off arrested my attention and it made me think of Daniel's prophecy about the Messiah being cut off. And this is written in Daniel 9. Let's read that quickly, just verse 26 and 27. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the princes shall come, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood. And unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Now the words to be cut off and covenant is connected because we cut a covenant. Think of Abram who was told to get the different sacrifices and that he had to cut them in half as the Lord God walked between them in the figure of eight. The number eight is closely related to covenant. And if God is anything, he's a covenant God. Coming back to the dreams interpretation, my husband's name is Daniel. So this cutting off of the vine was the Lord telling me that he is fulfilling his covenant with me, which is that which he spoke over me as his Joseph. The next evening, I had a quick dream again, and I saw highlighted in big letters the Strong's numbers G393. And I heard clearly the following. These numbers mean to cut asunder. Once again, this was referring to the cutting of a covenant. When I looked at the numbers in the strong concordance, it did not mean to cut asunder. Did I hear wrong? No. G393 is the word anatello, and it means to arise, specifically a plant out of the ground, or to arise as the sun and moon. You can see the reference to the vine there. So he gave me Isaiah 60 for 2024, and it starts with, Arise and shine, for your light has come. And the word tello in anatello means the end or last succession or series to the aim and purpose. So once again, the saying that he will fulfill his covenant that he made with me as his Joseph. Now this year he told me that I will have to endure greater suffering than before. At the same time, he also told me of how he's going to bless me beyond measure, more than I could possibly think of. Understanding that he's going to start to show me eventually greater things and things to come, then it makes perfect sense why he's telling me also that I will suffer more. The reason is to keep me humble and utterly dependent upon him. Listen to what Paul says and note his disposition towards his suffering. Note also from whom this thorn came. That's in 2 Corinthians 12. Let's read verse 1 and then verse 5. It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. 
I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. And then he talks about the visions and revelations that he saw. In verse 5 he says, Of such a one will I glory, yet of myself will I not glory, but in my infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth. But now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. And lest I should be exalted above measure, through the abundance of the revelations there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. When I had the dream of the vine being cut off that same day, my scripture reading, unbeknownst to me, was about Joseph being thrown into prison. And whenever I read about prisons, I'm reminded of a dream I received from Father about being thrown into concentration camps in the time to come. This is the dream. During this dream, the women and men were to sit in separate lines on the grass. Everybody had grey overalls on. The lines were extremely long. We had to sit cross-legged with our knees against the person's back in front of us. A guard was standing with his baton to the side, shouting out orders. He commanded the woman behind me to get up, but she did not understand him. He promptly walked over and started to beat the woman over the head with the steel baton. I felt every blow as this woman's body shook and crumbled under his assault, bludgeoning her head to a pulp and in great rage. She died behind me. I woke up from this dream, shivering in shock, and it took a few hours to wear off. Father has in various ways shown me that I will eventually be thrown into prison. At the same time, the life I now live can also be compared to a type of imprisonment, as I seldom go anywhere. I spend most of my days in my study room where I write my books and teachings and pray. And Paul was under house arrest and also wrote most of his epistles in these circumstances. Amy Carmichael, after many years of serving the Lord in India, fell and hurt herself badly to the point where she spent her last years of ministry in a room writing. So Father determines the seasons of our life for his purposes. And I consider my study room my prison. Having said that, just to give you context, I read the morning of the dream about G393 and its meaning to cut asunder, Genesis 39 about Joseph being in prison, and this is what it says about Joseph's stay in prison. That's in Genesis 39 verse 20, and Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound, and he was there in the prison. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in the prison. And whatsoever they did there, he was the doer of it. The keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand, because the Lord was with him, and that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper. Here Joseph was falsely accused and thrown into prison, but what was meant to be a jail sentence, God used for his glory. The keeper of our prison, in whatever form it takes, now or in the future, is Yeshua. And he entrusts unto us prisoners in this life whom we can minister to. He has entrusted many to me whom I minister to either through my teachings or personal contact. He entrusts them to me because I have shown myself faithful to him. Joseph did not fall for the temptation of Potiphar's wife. 
This was even before the law was written. So he instinctively by the Spirit knew that this was a sin against God and told her so. He was faithful. And furthermore, Joseph was faithful in prison and was rewarded great authority to rule and reign with Pharaoh at the end and could therefore provide for his brethren during the famine. The key is to be faithful in prison. Yeshua told his disciples in Luke 21, which is Luke's discourse, prophetically speaking of what is still to come, the following. That's in verse from verse 12. But before all these, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to synagogues and into prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. And it shall turn to you for a testimony. Settle it therefore in your hearts, not to meditate before what you shall answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. And ye shall be betrayed both by parents and brethren and kinsfolk and friends, and some of you shall they cause to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but there shall not an hair of your head perish in your patience. Possess ye your souls. Don't give up. We find Paul and Silas in Acts 16 after being flogged and bound, cast into a dungeon, worshipping God. And God, honoring their faith, opens the prison doors. Not just their prison doors, but all the prison doors. There where his servants, his friends are, those faithful and possessing their soul in patience, prison doors open. Not only were the prisoners changed, but the God and his family were saved. God looks after his servants who are imprisoned and the prisoners under his care. Having said earlier that all the letters are applicable to us in the book of Revelation, the same thing was said to the church of Smyrna. This time period is when the mark of the beast will be implemented and many Christians will find themselves poor and in great need. And just like was the case with Acts, believers will start to share their goods joyfully with one another in order to survive. The body will be united through this persecution, although those who do not possess their souls in patience will turn against each other. Let's read that in Revelations 2, verse 8. And unto the angel of the church of Smyrna write, These things save the first and the last which was dead and is alive. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them that say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He that have an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. With that, I want to share a word he gave me a few years ago after I asked him whether I would be sent to prison. This is that word and I want to share this word with you because some of you will also be cast into prison as per Luke 21 and the letter to the church of Smyrna. This is that word. It's called, I will send you. I will indeed send you as I do those whom I have prepared. As I've gone with my people through the wilderness, in the darkest of times, I'm their light. In the daytime, their compass. In hunger they bread and in thirst they water, in clothing they shelter and covering, in shoes they peace, always watchful over those I call my own, jealously guarding, directing and preparing the way. You shall go where I send you and there find a place prepared. Do not fear, little one, I will be waiting there for you, your prince in your palace. Though a prison, it will be ours. Do not fear, for I will never leave you. Where I send you, I will always provide. Know 
that this I've prepared you for and will finish that which I started. Not a minute sooner or later. All things are made beautiful in its time, even this. Therefore do not fear tomorrow. Fear me and live by the faith of my son. He is your rock and defender. Look only to him, the author and finisher of your faith. I also mentioned Psalm 25, 14, in the stones will cry out teaching, saying that the secret of the Lord is with them who fear him, and he will show them his covenant. In other words, he will perform his covenant. Remember, we are talking about friendship here, and the covenant that he has with his disciples as his friends, being one with them. This word secret speaks of the inner circle of intimate friends. It comes from H3245, which means foundation, appointed, and instructed. The seals workers during the tribulation just so happens to be the foundation layers. It also means to fix or seat themselves close together, sit in a conclave. And we know that John the Beloved sat so close to Yeshua that he laid his head on his chest. His head was on his heart. These are the ones he entrusted and with whom he could share his heart. What he shared with them is not what he shared with those outside the inner circle. They were his disciples who have left all to follow him and they stood in covenant with him. They were his friends. And coming back to cutting a covenant, we also know that the high priest was responsible for the cutting of the sacrifices in the temple. Romans 12 tells us that we are living sacrifices. Now, our high priest places us on the altar and there with the sword of the spirit, he divides between bone and marrow, soul and spirit and discerns the intents and motives of our heart. During our sanctification process, we are being cut to pieces and it is indeed a bloody story. So much so that we need to know that during the sanctification process, being cut off from family, friend and our own life, we are partaking in his suffering and being prepared to endure this coming tribulation. There can be no covenant without blood as we clearly see how Cain's offer being the fruit of the ground was rejected and Abel's blood offering well pleasing unto God. This is what I mean with the followers of Christ that are without a cross. They never entered into the inner court and allowed the high priest to separate every part unto him. They are crossless Christians and their life shows it. Many are there who want to walk a very intimate walk with him and be part of that inner circle where he shares his heart with them. This too is his desire. But it's on his terms. It remains on the terms of the covenant. A life for a life. The question is just how bad do you want it? And are you willing to count the cost? John the Baptist is called the friend of the bridegroom. In John 15, Yeshua calls his disciples no longer servants but friends. He tells them that nobody has greater love than he who lays his life down for his friends. And they are his friends. Once again, this is covenant talk, a life for a life. He tells them that because they are his friends, they know all things. Once again, showing us the intimacy in the walk of being his friend. We all have different kinds of friends in our lives, acquaintances, people a bit closer, and those who are very close to us, whom we feel safe to share our heart with. Why would it be different with him? He said to Miriam and Aaron that he speaks to Moses face to face. All are invited, but not all pay the price. John 17, Christ's high priestly prayer, he prays for these friends of his, representing the 144,000 virgins following him wheresoever he goes. And he specifically prays that they would be one as he and the Father is one, and that they must be one in the Father and him. Oneness lies at the heart of covenant, and this oneness is in body, soul, and spirit. For this reason, Paul said that he prays that they would be wholly sanctified, body, soul, and spirit, which is to be set apart in body, soul, and spirit. Union lies at the heart 
of covenant, just as it lies at the heart of a married couple. This is why he hates divorce, because when this covenant is broken, both parties are torn. We tear him afresh once we have reached this union and break covenant. At the same time, when we keep covenant with him, the blessing of that covenant he will perform. May not come when you would like it to come, but he has determined the season to show you his covenant with you. At the heart of our covenant with him lies faithfulness and truth. In Revelations 19 we read in verse 11, And I saw heaven opened, and behold a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Out of all the things he could have been called, he is called Faithful and True. In a world where faith unfaithfulness is the norm and truth relative, I can understand why he's coming back as the one faithful and true. What a rare commodity faithfulness and truth will be in the, sa- in the time to come, even more then than now. He is faithful to his covenant of salt with his priests, and he is true. In Hebrews 11, 6, we read that we must believe that he is and that he is a reward of those who diligently seek him. This means that we must believe that he is who he says he is. Nothing tests our faith by extension, our faithfulness, as this tribulation will do. I always say that it takes tribulation for the true church to stand up. Faith and faithfulness is two sides of the same coin. Faith is a matter of faithfulness and the ability to endure. Why? Because we have to have faith in the one who is faithful, whom we know as his friends. It's inevitable that when you enter into this kind of friendship with him, that you will be considered a loner. One that does not fit with the boys or girls and do not do what they do. You are a strange creature who values different things in life and therefore can no longer speak as you used to. You've been set apart unto him and find yourself willing to give up whatsoever he asks of you if he but only give you the grace to do so. You are a peculiar treasure, a royal priesthood unto him, but consider the offscouring of the earth. You walk after your rabbi with one determination, to know nothing else but Christ and him crucified. People look at your life and think that this is a failure, and that you are insignificant and all you do is suffer. But in you is formed Christ, whom you know as a friend that sticks closer than a brother. You long to hear the words of Matthew 25, verse 21. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things, and I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. I know that there are many out there that have felt they've been cut to pieces on God's altar. It's been so many years and at times you feel that you can no longer bear to be under his hand. At times you just want to give up and walk away from everything. I really do get that and so does he. We sometimes think that it was a walk in the park for him. But I think he really suffered and depended on Father so much that he needed him to face each day. Hebrews 5 tells us from verse 7, Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him, that was able to save him from death, and was heard in that he feared. Though he were a son, Yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Think of the consequences if he had to give up. But he did not. He kept going on even though the world he loved was against him. He took every lash on his back willingly. He allowed the thorns to pierce his head and he willingly laid upon the cross. Life was glorious for him, but it came at a great price. Father gave him friends whom he could share his life on earth with, and though being imperfect, he loved them dearly, knowing that they would suffer on his behalf, that they would give their lives for him. And still today, 
Father is giving him true friends. Friends who willingly lay upon the altar and say, cut away anything that you need to in order to make me like you. He sees your desire to follow him and to be as your rabbi. He sees every choice you make to humble yourself in the most difficult circumstances. You are sharing in his suffering and therefore, as imperfect as you are, you are his friend. Don't give up. Endure to the end. He will repay and he will reward his friends that keep covenant with him. I end this teaching with a special word from Father that he gave me in April 2021 for his friends. And when you listen to this word, remember that we spoke about the disciples being his friends and how disciples follow their rabbi. The word is called, I call you friends. My friends share in my suffering. They too become outcasts, the odd ones out, and yes, even though a part of society, yet not. For the things of the Spirit can only be discerned in the Spirit, and those who are of the flesh cannot see or hear with the ears and eyes of the Spirit being still veiled. But I alone am the great revealer. I alone open blind eyes and deaf ears. I alone can cause strongholds to fall as darkness is overcome by the light of my countenance. So that those who sit in darkness are those who declare, I have seen a light. They arise anew from where they were and walk on in the light of new revelation. Nobody but I can reveal the deeper things of the spirit for spirit speaks to spirit. And so my friends... Having received these revelations, do not walk as others do. They do not talk as others do. And just like me, they are alone, even in a crowd. I will never leave them. I will never forsake them. They are in me. They are those who walk to my rhythm, to the beat of my heart. They suffer in me, and they do it alone. But I see all things, and I know all things. Even this, though you are alone in this world, there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. I call you my friends, and my friends know what I want. Your intimacy with me disqualifies you with this world, for you walk by the Spirit and in the Spirit. You are not of this world, but I've called you by name. Have I not said that in this world you will have tribulation and that you must know that I've already overcome this world. Therefore, walk as I walked, not in the darkness of your understanding, but in the light of the spirit of truth and revelation. The deeper things in me are for those who are close, my friends. Can those who are not then understand? I call you my friends. And I will never leave you. Amen.